approved by the party, which is only the artist association and one printmaking association, in the case of practical, art, practical artists. Which is why the reform having a private if you like, facility to exhibit work or make work and exhibit it yourself in your own right became very important in the 1980s. They were still subject, of course, to some certain kinds of things that could be exhibited. And even today, if um, every year, even if you talk to a gallerist in, in Beijing, if anybody does any vaguely socially controversial painting, or any work which is seen as insulting the leadership, whereas in the past, through the 80s and 90s, that work could be produced, turned into a, a commodity, and exported freely, now, any work of art which is seen as insulting to China, and particularly sensitive to art, anything which involves a leadership portrait, those cannot be, they're stopped by custom. The works actually have to be inspected by custom. So the same kind of procedures which are applied to antiques, and still are applied to antiques, they have to have a stamp that says they're less than 100 years old from the Minister of Bureau of um, Archaeological Relic. Um, that has now been extended in a limited number of cases to contemporary works of art, and Chinese government is very sensitive to it. So there was a window from 80 to around about 2000 when this kind of movement of artworks was much freer in China, or much less supervised, I should say. Generally speaking, still very free. Um, actually, when you were talking about the censorship and things that's going on, like you know how you've got to get screened in China, I guess by now it's only inevitable that we, kind of like in Thailand, it's like you would have to be really far away from Thailand to kind of like did not know that certain kind of arts or certain kind of expression or political statements are not actually allowed. So um, I I don't know. I'm just I'm just making observation as we go along. But then could well, you? Well, there's two kinds of ways in which this kind of intervention can take place. One is that you know that legally you're not allowed to do certain kinds of things. Let's take Indonesia for example. You are not allowed to paint anything which insults the president of Indonesia. In Indonesia, artists have been imprisoned for that. Right. So and artists know that there are certain subject matters which which are, must be handled with either discretion or not at all. But in China, it's different. In China, they have an actual body for examining that before. You go. Hmm. But then it would be as le as illegal as in Indonesia or in Thailand, if you actually insult the leader of the country. I'm, sure they, oh, well, I'm not they sure that it's the same thing at all. Uh, but still, I mean, one is, one is, is if you like, passive acquisition, acquisition, acquiescence before the application of the law. The other is positive knowledge of the law before it's applied. Right. It may not, it depends on the context, whether how, how effective this is. And anyway, these issues are not terribly, in my view, significant. I was actually going to ask, like, are these political limitations? Actually, it's, it's a big... Well, I would give you... I, can, I, would, I prefer to, to get my concrete examples, and it might be delicate if I went by Chinese examples rather than Taiwan. Um, let me just say that this year I published an article in a big compendium of, um, on Australian art, which was about Austra uh, Asian artists in Australia. And there was a Chinese artist who had done a picture of Mao Zedong, which had Mao Zedong in it, in 2002, in Australia. And the book is about Australian art, and it had been sold in, or it was a vis vis visible in Australia, widely published in Australia. The Chinese printer refused to print it. Because this is, be what you have to remember is you use the word law in a very general sense, but this law and is actually regularly applied bureaucratic regulation. And it seems that between five and six years ago, the Chinese government applied to, as a notice to printers a particular regulation which warned them they cannot print certain kinds of imagery. And this kind of imagery was particularly leadership portraits. Leadership portraits are very sensitive in China. Leadership portraits meaning in sense political leadership portraits. Mao Zedong and members of the current members of the Politburo. So that's a different set of political constraints. Um, I, and I'm not going to discuss the problem in Thailand for very long. <laughs>
I, I, I. Um, not again to character. I'll try to characterize and summarize the whole chapter, which we can't do here. But um, one of the very, I thought, especially interesting um, aspects of this chapter have to do, has to do with uh, this idea of how to integrate in, integrate tradition uh, with this modernism that's coming in and the ways that that is accomplished to greater or lesser degree under different circumstances. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? And how Dr. Johnson that has said that the last refuge of uh, scoundrel is patriotism, the last <laughs> refuge of the corrupt artist is tradition <laughs> in a modern world. Tradition and modernity are two sides of the same, the interdefining pairs. So they're kind of a practice on one side and a stylistic on the other. To claim the authority of tradition is to say, I invented the tradition from which authority may be claimed. This is all quintessentially a modern position. As an example by uh, endless analysis of postage stamps in late 19th century Austria, Austria and so forth, part of the world. Uh, and it's a universal phenomenon. The claiming of tradition is about a political interpretation of what, how the past may be made relevant or put into the present. It is not a natural category. It is an artificial category. And modern, the modernists as well. But the point about the modernists, the modern says much more explicitly, I will tell you which bits of the past I think are important as projections into the future, as indications of what the future should be. The whole point about modern, the modern is it's proleptic quality, it's predictive, it's, pre it's prescriptive quality. That's what the difference is. But that, that means that the, 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 what is so-called the traditional is separated from its customary base and selected to be representative of tradition. That's one. You actually, at one point, you talk about how you feel tradition as a as an artistic concept in Thailand is somewhat um, constructed or reconstructed. It's not. It's, it's something that is almost reclaimed from the past um, after having been lost to some extent. Well, and you know, look at mural painting. Mural painting was lost. Monk painters. Yeah, I think that's the specific Monk painters that disappeared. You look at the paintings in Port Royal. Um, Compare them with the last inheritors of the monk uh, workshop tradition, which is probably Kruin Kong in the 1850s, and then the, the attempt to re examine what quote unquote traditional Thai painting was in the 1950s. It's a selection, it's a particular privileging of certain kind of pictorial and decorative colori colorist tendencies. And there's a, there is a debate in Thai between um, Thai Mun Saman Khut, the father of Pakhtawa, and, um, sorry I forget his name, but a particular artist. Chulatat. Chulatat. Chulatat, thank you. Um, where, where was this published? I can't remember. Um, I think I mentioned it. 17. Yeah, there's a, there's a discussion about the use of the color, particularly use of color grounds in mural painting and whether these should be transferred to um, hotel decorative scheme. Which, um, this but, is, that was done in Thai Kadi Sipsa, um, in 1970s, uh, I can't, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, it's early 1970s. So this discussion has been had in Thailand, it's just the text are not widely circulated or made available these days. And I don't think they've been translated. Well, you do draw some conclusions between China and Thailand and trying to see if there are some um, consistencies despite the tremendous differences, and there are, uh, you list quite a few differences. They each have historical backgrounds that are very different, political backgrounds and structures very different between the two countries. Their cultural values, uh, forces shaping uh, the discourses in relation to international art, the way they relate to international art. Um, their traditions of academic and official art. Um, uh, uh, the role of curators is different in Thailand and China. But you do draw some um, interesting parallels and you say their use of, um, during the 1980s and 90s, there is increasing similarity in their uh, turning to tradition or bracketing tradition and reusing it in another context. 
Um, yeah, like uh, for example, Gawain Daz uses calligraphy, or uh, um, uh, you could even say it's a bit of a long, long straw. But I mean, Camin's use of Tolkien, you know, it starts in the nineties. I can have different to Sydney and others. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of privileging of script elements which seem to be distorted or not according to a contemporary notion of what applies in a certain decorative formulation. <coughs> that seems to be common. And of course, the awareness of the exotic, if you like, to outsiders, the awareness of the exotic, exotic or somehow in a peculiar way attractive nature of the script, even though people can't read it, they don't see it as language. To people looking at Thai script who don't read Thai, and people looking at Chinese who don't read Chinese, there's this kind of privileging of that kind of an aura around the script, which sometimes allows an aesthetic value to be translated between cultures. A bit like you know Japanese um, um, printers in the 1930s learning how to do Gothic script for Western Gothic script for certain kinds of advertising. Lettering is always interesting to the people who do illustration. You also talk about the, the both countries being increasingly um, concerned or uh, preoccupied with consumerism, of course, the growth of the economies and the, the growth of a new class, uh, in a very educated elite class in, in each culture. Um, artists' use of satire, uh, you find, is something that emerges from both societies. Um, uh, and Although it's very restricted, you know, there's no, there's no anti. Um or Bon Pain or uh, Dom. It's always anti McDonald's or anti KFC. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm intimately aware of this because I mean, I've just been in the United States and, and I, I see those sorts of phenomena of mass catering as, you know, rather straightforward, not very attractive and, in a certain sense, anti, anti sensibility. But still, I mean, but you see them all over the world. But why is it the American particular kinds of fast food always get the stick? I'm so nervous, Well, I don't, I'm not going to comment on that, but I mean, Evan K, you can know, think of five examples. Which... And you also, you also talk about art curricula in schools and competitions in both societies um, having a strong influence on the development of style or the use of style yeah. in both China and Thailand, which is, I thought, very Does anybody know about this exhibition in China in 1999? There were quite a lot of very interesting exhibitions just in that year, including, of course, the Count of, the, uh, Count of Shanghai Biennale exhibition, which the dead body appears, but there was also uh, this one, Art for Sale, from Supermarket Art, and this is a trolley produced by some girl uh, with a couple of cover. Uh, so, there's a, you, and you can think of several, um, uh, who's the, um, the guy who exhibited um, anti-McDonald's posters in Dadu around this time. There were a couple. I can't remember exactly the name. I'm thinking of Pink Man. The Pink Man. Well, I think Money. Pink Man. Yeah, um, yeah. Pink Man. No, not many. No, the, not the only thing. Too much probably. No. I mean, think of anti taking up consumer images. Is a is a. Uh, huh? Is it, wasn't it Barita? Barita. Huh? Yeah, there's several Thai artists who work with this kind of critique, critique, critique of um, uh, uh, poster of the, uh, the consumer goods and the way they, their imagery is used, manipulated. And I, I do I find, I also find that really I think the core of your book occurs in this chapter in many ways. You talk about how you do conclude that modernity is already present in both China and Thailand in its own form, apart from the modernity that we speak about in the West, and how the borrowing that occurs in both China and Thailand in terms of borrowing the Euro-American for their own discourses, um, that certainly occurs. We see these what we see as imports, imported styles or imported um, uh, ways of working. Um, and they can often look, in some ways, derivative or hybrids of some sort, but that they usually have different function within the context, within China. And here, for China. example, is a group. Uh, in the early 1980s, the uh, group of artists who've been uh, 
um, shut off by the Cultural Revolution because they had been forced to go down to the countryside in 1964 or 1966 and not been allowed to experiment with Impressionism. So around 1980 to 1985, there's a particular group called the cut -off, Half Cut Off Group. He started working with source of expressionism and post impressionist colorism, yes. which in China at this time had a very strong effect. And it made Paint Oil Painting look extremely vital for a lot of the uh, people interested in painting. Um, and also, you see the beginning of the re emergence of something which had been shut off by the Communist Party's relation to Lu Xun. You know, like the Chinese propagandized themselves having a left-wing print art print movement in the 1920s and so forth. But by the 19th, uh, by the 1940s, by the establishment of the uh, People's Republic in 1949, a lot of those highly expressionist print or um, uh, other kinds of uh, European um, critical uh, relationships, emotional critical relationships to the lived reality of life um, were were only to be focused on the old regime, on the old days, rather than on the present. In, in the 19, early 1980s, they begin to appear, and this is a theatrical scene, of course, but you get this kind of rough, bumpy, and sometimes very individualized expression on faces beginning to appear again, which had been censored out for 30 years. Because that was about the old society. Now we have glorious, wonderful China. Now they start looking at things and saying, it's not so comfortable. But it's very interesting, or it's more colorful, or it's more <coughs> dynamic, very simple things. But that would be cut out of practice in the uh, previous 30 years. Uh, there's an image I've been showing you, which I want to underline here, which is another very different relationship, although some people might want to think it's somewhat like the relationship of piracy to modern Thai, to modern Thai art. The different, the, when you look at the details, you find it. This is a very different relationship to uh, uh, what I call an endogenous art form. This is a painting of Udoren by Maximov. The period from 1953 to 1959 is a very intense period of quotes unquote learning from the Soviet Union, who is seen as the revolutionary big brother, and lots of Chinese. Translations existed, even probably more than our translations from Western books today in Thailand, existed in China at that time from Russian. They translated Russian books, Russian art books, Russian artworks were brought to China. And Maximov, a particular academic painter who was actually quite flexible in what he would let the students do, starting off from a rather simple academic base up to Impressionism, um, came and taught in China for two years from. Um, to 55 to 57. There's a graduation group. Those artists then became the core of the next group of academic teachers in China. Uh, and um, uh, I haven't gone into any great detail in this particular text. You can have to look at my other book called Modernities of Chinese Art to find those details. Um, so we have this particular period when there's a ma massive importation of imagery from outside lots of contact with artists, um, and particular uh, training artists come, to artists who train are coming, uh, which, um, no, you put your batteries there, you could have put the external power on, if you were to type in. I'm wondering if maybe we want a five minute break, and then no. I'll be uh, listen. You want to start now, or? Okay. <laughs> How's everyone feel? Right. It's a long way down. Those who want to No break. Keep going. 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 Keep uh, I respond to the chapter, but I want to, I want to, to you know, but I mean, I have nothing to prepare for the people of uh, the world. This girl, oh, yes, hello. Uh, it's a good book in general, but for me, 
I can call that a, is it a, a the book of compare by contrast. That's a, a John said as before. Because uh, from experience since 1990, I mean the was in the Stan uprising in Thailand in 1973. I mean, mostly the uh, the political uprising there and all those things is uh, is, uh, is limited by the Communist Party in China. I see the the uh, the hegemony of uh, Chinese. Uh, Communist idea to Thailand since the uh, set up the Communist Party. I mean, that's why I, I don't talk about the, 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 the book that this is very. Uh, I just want to uh, take in point some point of view. I mean, it's very hard to compare, even though, even though by the geography, by figure, by many things. Because art in Thailand. I cannot say that uh, we are strongly fully from from the West, but it's from Eurocentric, mostly uh, in the early form of Italy. It is quite uh, specific for from uh, uh And then the art in Thailand is like a review, it's like a jumping. It's not really connected between year by year or according to is a leading from who moves in the law or the art. Also, once when we are talking is about the, the the idea of uh pottery art in Thailand during eighty or even though in seventy until uh, ninety is it's very hard to say that uh, Thai there have a, a free or a concept to make it art, uh, even though in Haiti that uh, there's a lot of the artists from the Finnish education from Europe, from America, in fact, like Montien or Aria or many, uh, Gamon or Pina. But we have a limit of uh, expressions of their work because things, uh, uh, we don't have a censorship by the law, but we have a uh, a kind of, a kind of, uh, uh, morality or something like that by using uh, religious and monarchy system based. Yeah. So, also art is controlled by, by that the term of, of the the law. Of I mean, during the the eighties in Thailand, there's a lot of the company, private company, come to support in Thailand, like Toshiba, like uh, Bangkok Bank, Thai Commerce Banks, many things. I mean, this is a, a big problematics of Thai movement. It's not really support because they have a concept of to control the artists who uh, who contest in the in the. Uh, Support. They have a. They set the concept. They set the idea. They set the many things. It's quite different from China. I mean, well, I mean, for me, uh, China and Thailand before. I mean, like a forty years ago or fifty years ago, China is like a ghost. We cannot talk about China like this. I mean, I'm very surprised that. Uh, one day we we are we are have a big group uh, compared high art in China. This is a, this is very changeful because the propaganda of a, a, a Thai government or Thai state at that time is making China is like a uh, a bad guy. They have a poster, but for Americans they have a, a rigorous idea, a freedom things like. This. Times story 30, 30 years or 40 years, times change and so on. And the problem of uh, uh, China and Thailand, we are focused on the, like, during the 70s, 
in China they have a star, but in Thailand they are they're just making the idea from China. I mean, from my experience in during '73 or '76, that I just copied the rain court and the sculpture book from China. The rain collection called uh, rain. Mm. It's very strong influence from uh, Thailand. The idea of a uh, Art and culture, art for life. It's a big book. It's like a Bible of Thai artist movement in that time during the seventies. But during seventies in China, there I mean, uh, the artists like Wang Rui or Ai Weiwei or setting the star book, making underground movement to against the idea of uh, 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 cultural revolution after. Can of four. I mean, this is quite a different point. And then eighties, when the when Deng Xiaoping announced the policy of uh, against the bad spiritual in 1980, 82. I mean, those are the, I mean the star who they are spread around, escape to uh, like everywhere, escape to America, from even to Japan, and many places. But the policy of Deng uh, Xiaoping at that time to open the country to the West. If you compare in Thailand in AD, it's kind of we just wrap up by by the the idea of the well, I can say the state apparatus using the private company to wrap up Thai artists. I mean, well, I mean, Avonga artists like Montier, well, we can say Avonga. Uh, they do, but they cannot do it in Thailand. The shows in the abroad is not in the lands of their own. This is quite different. Also, the in the uh, education system as well. I mean, it's very hard to say that we have a a setting rule of of a education of study art. I mean, syllable gone setting nearly 60 years. Syllable gone is like a, it's like a half university. You cannot see the movement of a uh, setting new idea of uh, like theoretical or historical study, or critical study in, in the old master's school like this. But in Kava, in Central Academy of, of uh, in China in Beijing, they set in many, many uh, schools. That's why I mean, compare by contrast, we can see, we can see a low form, a big low form. Yeah, this is a great, this is a great I, idea. I, I, quite, I quite agree. I mean, mm. one of the, and, and, and I'm sure there's some people in the room have the same opinion, which is that, um, there's a certain there's a certain lack of theoretical debate that takes place in the Thai world, which has seen, for example, Ajahn Chetanar's uh, attempt to have to introduce critical readings and to develop a, a certain kind of Thai criticism, um, which you don't you find the, almost the opposite extreme exists in China, almost as if you can only have art if you have a lot of texts about it or if someone's written a lot about it, or if someone's thought a lot about it. And of course that comes directly from propaganda training at all stages of the education system where ideas are debated in a context where you have social conflict uh, right through the 80s and the 90s, which causes a resetting of theoretical or propaganda positions. Even by the party itself, it has to readjust all the time. And that seems that kind of dynamic, that historical dynamic, if you like, to what the party wants, what it gets, how you argue about it, what is in circulation as ideas. But then, of course, the Chinese artist has it is in a very different position because the Thai artist, in a certain sense, started out as a craftsman and has been kept there as a craftsman, as a decorator. Whereas the Chinese artist in the early uh, period of the 20th century, particularly